Um, if you'll allow me a personal sort of old guy reminiscence, um, Brad and DePaul are putting us up at the Palmer House. The last time I had been in the Palmer House was in August of 1968. I was um, sleeping in Grant Park with a whole bunch of other people who wanted to end the war. The police were not happy that I was in Grant Park, or that we were in Grant Park. Let's not make this too personal. So they <laughs> fired tear gas at us. And so we ran away, and they fired more. And then they started beating us with billy clubs. This was sort of the first riot in the US that was live on TV, because the technology had just made that possible. So we, of course, chanted, the whole world is watching, as if that would stop them. It didn't. Um, so a bunch of us ran into the lobby of the Palmer House, seeking shelter from billy clubs and tear gas. Uh, to no avail, <laughs> the police followed us inside. Um, so it is you know, with a great sense of delicious historical irony that I now return to the Palmer House as a paying guest. Uh, and to sort of make it even more, um, I think, delightful for me, as this was all going on, the Democratic National Convention was occurring in Chicago, which is the reason that we were all assembled there in the first place. And Senator Abraham Ribicoff of Connecticut was on the platform to nominate George McGovern, who was the anti-war candidate mm -hmm. of that era. And as he was speaking, he talked about, and I quote, the Gestapo police tactics in the streets of Chicago. And the then Mayor Richard Daley, not to be confused with Mayor Richard Daley, um, <laughs> <laughs> shouted at him, and it was caught on live camera. And he said, uh, and again, I quote, um, you, you Jew, son of a bitch, mother go home. <laughs> and the idea that that could be going on in 1968, and here it is, 2016, and I am luxuriating in a chair in the Richard M. Daly building, <laughs> just makes me just happier than any of you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for telling that story. I had an icebreaker plan, but this was much, much better. So, so we'll skip. I'm, I'm going to ask you anyway. I'm going to ask my icebreaker because I really want to know. I know sure. you're a, a, mu uh, a, a musical buff. Um, you were a longtime musician, um, and that you're also a baseball fan. So if you were uh, batting cleanup. Yeah. For the Yankees, you're a Yankee guy, right? No, no, Mets. Oh Jesus Christ, Brad! Was it the Mets? So, did you, let's just start over. Okay. Hey, look, look, I grew up in I grew up in Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. Okay. And you know, to root for the Yankees was to root for the, the they had pinstripes on their uniforms, just like the capitalists on Wall Street. Right. Okay. We hated them. Fair enough. <laughs> I lived within walking distance of Ebbets Field. So my apologies. Dodgers. My, my Dodgers. apologies. Oh, the Dodgers. Dodgers. Oh, so, okay. okay. So if you were to back clean up for the Dodgers, yeah. What would your walk up song be? Um, wow, what a great question. Right. I already know. Mine is, just to give you a moment to yeah. think, mine is Money for Nothing by Dire Straits. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think mine would probably be um, Free Money by Patti Smith. There we go. <laughs> because you're playing baseball for money. I mean, it's, yeah. It, yeah. So anyway, uh, I mentioned that, and obviously your, your story about where we are at the moment brings up this idea to me, that, and as long as I've known you, you're a man of very eclectic interests. You're uh, a historian. I think the word you're looking for is dilettante. Dilettante, <laughs> perhaps. But it, since you said it, I'll, I'll let that slide. <laughs> um, but yes, you have this amazing uh, your interest in so many things, politics, um, sports, music. Um, and I'm curious, as a writer, um, what, do, what does that mean? How does that affect your work? How should writers, I mean, I think there's a, there's a and you teach at a film school, oftentimes film students I think, focus on, so, so specifically on, I want to be a screenwriter, I want to be a filmmaker, that they sometimes exclude the rest of the world that could inform their work. And I, I'm curious how much that means to you, that all of the things that you research, all the things that you know about and study and have passion for, how does that infuse into your work and how have you kept that alive? Well, uh, just to answer your question backwards, I think, you know, there are, and I'm about to take the profession that you and I both make our living at and sell it down the river. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think there are real dangers to students who at an early age go into screenwriting as a study in school, mm -hmm. and then they write screenplays about people who are writing screenplays, about people who are writing screenplays. <laughs> and I think if you do that long enough and hard enough, you just sort of 
disappear up your own butthole. <laughs> um, and um, even though, you know, I was a chair and I'm a professor in a mm -hmm. school that teaches just that, right. I actually believe you, you kind of sort of have to know everything. And I would recommend to students and do recommend to students that you take courses that are of no conceivable practical benefit because 15, 20 years down the road, that's what you're going to write about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, unless you know something way outside of the life you know, my guess is that either you're going to write something incredibly pure and beautiful about the life that you've lived, or you're going to run out of material. Right. You know, so um, if I know stuff about early 19th century fictional arch fiends or about, um, um, you know, post-punk music in New York in the late 70s and early 80s, all of, you know, um, one of, um, I think it was Patricia Krenwinkel, one of the Charles Manson girls who is mm -hmm. now doing time, um, said at her trial, everything was to teach me something. Right. I think she meant it in a different way, but, <laughs> <laughs> right. but I think, I, I, I actually believe, I don't think there's anything, I don't think there is such a thing as wasted knowledge. Right. So. Okay, so one of the things that I noticed, you know, and you, you, you place your knowledge in what you write, and you're also a novelist. Uh, one of the things I failed to mention in my introduction to you, um, Howard's written novels, continues to write novels. Um, and I know you're an avid reader. I think reading is being lost, particularly among this generation of younger writers that I work with. Uh, what is the value of not only reading screenplays, which it seems hard to get them to do, but, but reading novels, reading nonfiction? Well, I, I'm not, I mean, uh, once we talk about value, it feels like, you know, what's the, what's the return on investment mm -hmm. for reading? And, and that seems to me the, the absolute wrong way of, of okay. looking at it. You know, I became a reader um, because I hated the world I found myself in. Um, you know, um, my parents were fighting all the time. Uh, I would hide under the piano, but then, you know, it was too late for that, so I had to go to bed. So I read with a flashlight under the blankets, and what I loved about reading was that it transported me to a world that was real different than right. the one that I found myself in and couldn't stand. And the idea, be, the, the, the kind of slow transformation between reading with a flashlight under the blanket and hiding in a world that somebody else had built out, and, and kind of saying, wait, I could, I could build out a world, and it would fit me maybe even a little better, it would be a little bit more bespoke. Right. It seemed like a very, very kind of easy transition to make. So for me, writing and reading are, are not very different activities. They're mm -hmm. both about inhabiting worlds, except when you're writing, you sort of have a world that is just a little better fitting. Okay. Well, so I mentioned a few mo moments ago, all these things that you do. You, me you mentioned last night these wonderful communities that you're, you're part of, Sundance and the Film Preservation Board yeah. and, and various other um, functions that you have in your life and teaching the Writers Guild, of course. How do you manage to balance your creative life with, with those obligations? By doing all of them badly. <laughs> I don't um, buy that. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, at every moment in my life, there's always something that's about to fall off the edge of the map. Mm -hmm. And so I grab that, and then something else is about to fall. Right. So, um, you know, um, you wouldn't want to have my dreams. Oh, um, I see. Yeah. I'm, you know, always in an alley in Argentina, and some gaucho with a curved knife is coming at me to kill me because right. <laughs> I'm behind on a deadline. Okay. So, I see. you know. Um, one of the lovely things about the Sundance Institute and about the Writers Guild and things like that are they are as socially legitimate forms as I've ever been able to find of avoiding writing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know. You have the best procrastinations. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, they're sort of socially validated, they're acceptable. <laughs> Nobody calls you out for them. Right. But, you know, when you're in a long, boring meeting, there you are, not writing. Right. right. It's kind of like win win. Do you find yourself, do, do you take? Do you make special time to go off and, and write, to find places to go and write? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's less a sp space than a time. I mean, I mm -hmm. get up frighteningly early. My best writing hours are from roughly 4.45 or 5 in the morning till mm -hmm. around 8.30 when the phone starts to ring or I have to bat back emails or whatnot. Right. So and then during summers, I go 
hide. Right. Okay. You know, um, I find it very hard when I'm teaching and there's all of these student screenplays in my head. Um, it gets confusing in there. Yeah. You yeah. know, so I have to either wake up real early or, you know, um, wait for the summer or just um, take some dear and precious obligation and uh, chuck it over sure. my shoulder. Yeah, that speaks to something that I, I try to talk a lot about in class is process, your personal process. At least knowing what works for you and being able to mm -hmm. figure out these hours are best for me yeah. and, and being able to name that and protect that time. Um, it's just very early, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, I yeah. used to, I went from owl to lark at some point. Okay. Uh, you know, yeah. when I started, I could only write very late at night. Right. And now, by the end of the day, um, there's just so much stuff swirling around my head that I just want to drink my 10 scotches and forget it. <laughs> <laughs> what brand, by the way? Um, uh, Tom Schulman. Okay. <laughs> we were trying to work that in, Tom. <laughs> we are trying to figure out how to work this in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good job. Old, Way to go, old Howard. Tom Schulman, Old Tennessee Whiskey. Yes. <laughs> 90% barrel aged. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm curious about your work. I, the, it, obviously, everyone looks at you now as the Writers Guild West president, and that's something that is um, at the top of your resume, so to speak. But your work with Sundance, you've been doing this for quite a while. Um, what are you seeing in the writers and the filmmakers um, that, that's coming in that you're enjoying that, that we should learn from and sort of try to emulate? You know, um, I don't know that there's anything I'm seeing that people should try to emulate. Mm -hmm. I think that writers get into trouble when they try to emulate well, I mean, stuff. I'm, more specifically, yeah. I mean... Like, you know, uh, oh, they're looking for, you know, transgendered comedies now. So, at you Sundance? Know, <laughs> yeah, yeah so, so you write one, but, you know, you, you write something like just like Transparent, but right. nowhere near as good, right. you know. And, and so I don't like, I think following the marketplace will invariably leave you a day late and a dollar short. Mm -hmm. In terms of what I'm seeing, um, is all kinds of people coming from different places telling stories that only they could tell. I mean, two of the films that have come up through the Sundance Writing Labs, um, you know, while I've been working there, uh, are, uh, or, or three of the films, um, Ryan Coogler's Fruitvale, which right. is an extraordinary film, right. Um, Miranda July's Me and You and Everyone We Know, which couldn't be more different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Ryan's film is um, f infused with a sense of community, and Miranda's is, you know, white people and their problems. Right. And then there's Beasts of the Southern Wild, which right. is like, God knows what that is, but thank God that it's there. We had Lucy here a few, a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what I see in the Sundance Labs. Uh, are people writing about a part of the world that they know better than anybody else and that they have an absolute necessity to make a movie about. Uh, and then I also see, um, you know, a certain number of, of overly sincere regional melodramas. You know, uh, I can't tell you how many screenplays in which, you know, the fracking company is coming to town. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I like that movie, but, you yeah. know, yeah. Right. Um, but generally, um, somebody like Ryan or somebody like, some buddies like Lucy and mm -hmm. Ben see the world in a particular way and won't stop or sleep until they can find a way of building that out into a world that the rest of us can see. So do you think this is a time for, for writers to actually, I mean, quit chasing Quit, quit chasing the studio work, quit, quit chasing the, the high concept so much, and look for that independent personal story that, that, that comes out of where they are and who they are and what they want to tell. Is, that, is it now the time to do that? Well, I think there's never been a better time to do that okay. because the studios have seeded that ground completely. Right. It used to be, for instance, that Warner Brothers um, you know, had one slot. They called it the Ben Affleck slot you know, for making a movie that wasn't a tentpole. Right. And now, according to the latest uh, news conference I read a couple of um, weeks ago, they're not even doing that, you know. Um, so the, the, the kind of, um, you know, th so for um, 10 months or 11 months a year, we get superheroes in, in tights. And then for the other two months a year, when they think, oh, God, the Oscars are coming, <laughs> we get superheroes without types. Yeah, so right. we get, like, great mathematicians and great physicists sure. and great civil rights leaders and great snipers. Codebreakers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I hate that shit. 
Um, you know, it, it just bears so little resemblance to lived life as I know it, or most right. people I know know it. And so I think that because the movie studio's definition of what a movie is has never been narrower, and it's shifted all the way over here as if that's normal. I mean, it's almost like the Republican Party. And I think that it's opened up this space for the kind of movies that used to be studio movies that are no longer are things that the studios are interested in. And I think television has opened up this other huge space where writers' voices are things that people are interested in because of, not in mm. spite of, who they are. Right. You know? And that, that gives me hope, and it gives me, as a viewer, a great deal of pleasure, too. Great. When I was um, a student, when you were teaching at USC, I, I thought of getting into the Writers Guild as just this, um, I, I would guess, a, 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 a validation or a club or, or some sort of mark of professionalism that, um, you know, like making the big leagues. You know, it was just this thing that I would cross over that threshold and be this thing. Well, well but, but, it, but it is that. It I mean, is, but now I, but, but when I went, once I was in and began to take advantage of the guild as a, as a member and, right. and it became a completely different thing um, and a more important thing to me. So I wonder what it is to you. I mean, what is the writer, I mean, you've grown up with the Writers Guild in many ways, so what is the Writers Guild to you? Well, to go backwards for a second, sure. I mean, um, because of the proliferation of, of scripted television, there are now, you know, when I woke up this morning, there were 408 scripted television shows. I think by the time we're speaking now, who knows, <laughs> 4 to 20, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we um, have about 400 new members a year, which is, um, but even so, I mean, that for us historically is a pretty large number. Um, but it's still um, smaller than the number of people who enter Major League Baseball every year. Right. So your odds of being a professional screen and television writer are actually not as good as your odds of uh, being in Major League Baseball. Um, so that's kind of sobering. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, um, particularly for those of us who are pitching. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, but what the Writers Guild means to me is, um, you know, it goes back very basically to the idea of what a union is, which is a bunch of women and men get together to uh, get for themselves things that are very important that no one of them has the individual leverage to achieve for his, him or herself. You know, um, so uh, you or me or... Tom e Shulman? Even, even Tom. <laughs> <laughs> going up against the studio, who wins? You know, right. most of the time, the studio does. Right. But um, we all get together as a union, and we can get things for ourselves. Things that we take for granted now would not have been possible were it not for that kind of united effort. At the beginning, there was a thing called the writers in the 1930s, 40s, which was actually more of a club than a union. Um, I don't think it's any accident that the Writers uh, was founded in 1921 and Musso and Frank, which has the best martinis in Hollywood, was founded in Indeed. 1919. I think, you know, right. we, we can understand that origin story mm -hmm. pretty well. Um, and they first started getting uppity because at that time the studios decided who got the credit on a film. So if the, the studio had had a relative, their name, your name could be on a film, your name could not be on a film, you could write all the film and somebody's relative's name was on the film. Uh, you know, the son-in-law also rises. Um, <laughs> and so uh, the first thing they demanded was, we want writers to determine screen credit, not the studios. And they became a guild and fought for that and, and won. The studios didn't like that, they formed a kind of Counter Guild, which was a company union, which actually then became the Academy of Motion Picture uh, Arts and Sciences. So whenever you see somebody holding an Oscar, uh, at least in its origins, that golden statuette came from union-busting impulses on the part of the studios. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it evolved, things that we now take for granted, like um, pension, because writers' careers are often as short as the careers of professional athletes, so you get some money even after they're no longer hiring you. Or health so that if you get sick, it's not that your first stop is the emergency room and the second stop, bankruptcy court. 
or residuals, so that if people continue to make money off of something you wrote, some of that revenue stream actually comes back to you. Um, or there are so many things that as writers we don't even think about now that would not have been possible except for the fact that we're standing on the shoulders of those writers who came before us who fought very hard and in some instances struck to get those things. Right. Uh, but I could show you photographs of Warner Brothers in 1946 turning fire hoses on writers and unionists um, on Pass Avenue in, in Burbank. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, um, we take these things very seriously, and so do they. Right. Well, it was nice to see, you know, the Trumbo story come out this year in a way that other people could access it. I don't know how you felt about the film, but I was excited to see that the story was told yeah. in and a larger way. Any film that has its most poignant, dramatic moment taking place at in the Writers Guild Awards. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or a bathtub. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I'll, I'll go see either of those yes. movies. Um, so what are we fighting for now? Um, we have these benefits. We have certainly a, as you said, a better situation yeah. than, than, our, than our founders had. Um, but there are still challenges. And um, diversity obviously being an issue. Yeah. And I've seen you speak about that. And I've seen you write about that. Uh, what are we facing right now on that issue in Hollywood? Um, I do want to talk about diversity because it's mm -hmm. very important to me in a whole bunch of ways. But I want to talk about the larger picture first. Sure. Um, the six companies that are basically the entertainment industry that control 90% of what you watch, probably about 80% of what you hear. Um, one of the th interesting things that's happened is all of these used to be sort of part of large conglomerates. I mean, the company that owned uh, Universal also was GE, which also made toaster ovens and aircraft engines. Right. You know, um, Gulf and Western, which owned Paramount, was also you know all you know Gulf, you know, as in as in you know oil and gas. Right. Uh, one by one, through a series of mergers, a series of purchases, the entertainment companies are pretty much pure entertainment plays now. Uh, Fox sold off its um, news holdings. Warner Brothers, um, you know, spun off AOL because there is very little that is reliably and repeatedly profitable as running an entertainment industry company. Um, the combined profits of those six companies, uh, going back eight years, uh, was about twenty-three, twenty-four billion dollars a year. Now it's. Um, north of $49 billion mm -hmm. a year. So their profits have doubled in the past decade. Um, writers' salaries have not. Right. Um, so particularly with the wild proliferation of television, all of those scripted series, and the fact that making television is, because of the number of eyeballs around the globe, almost risk-free. There are many, many series that are in profit before the first episode is aired in the U.S., because of foreign sales and because of various kinds of streaming and ad revenues and whatnot. So there's a situation where the work we do creates this enormous, unprecedented, near riskless profit for the companies, but yet we are regarded as a fixed cost that they are trying to push down. And in fact, despite the fact that there are more writers employed than ever before in human history by, by the industry, the average salary of screenwriters and TV series writers has actually gone slightly down in the same period that their profits have doubled. So if you ask what the task is, l we need to avenge that discrepancy. Yes. Um, so I think that's the larger picture, and most everything we talk about stems from that. In terms of diversity, boy, have we got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, 50% of us are female. So shouldn't 50% of us be female? Right. I mean, it seems like it doesn't require much thought. Um, and, um, you know, when I walk in, you know, when, when you look at, at the award shows and, you know, there's a TV show and, um, you know, somebody wins and they're happy and then 17 writers step up and you see 16 tuxes in a dress and they're all white guys. You know, um, it um, says something about our industry. And in features, um, it's um, worse than it is in, in television. 
uh, roughly, um, um, I believe, kind of one in four feature jobs goes to women. It's about one in three in television. Uh, and, and the numbers for minorities uh, are horrific, which is doubly awful because we, many of us live in Los Angeles, which is a, to use that phrase, majority minority city, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, um, you know, the world of a writer's room or the world of studio executives does not look like the world. Right. Uh, and so uh, we could very easily say, look, it's the Writers Guild. They make the employment decisions. What can we do about it? Our membership reflects the hiring practices of the industry. We don't control the industry, so what can we do? And my feeling is that that is a cop-out. That's just saying, okay, the world is broken and we're going to mirror it. And I think that we need to do a lot better than that. Um, my mom uh, went to film school. She was a single working mom. She decided to reinvent herself completely at the age of 37. She went to NYU film school when no women went to film school. Uh, she wanted to be a director. Um, who were women directors in the US at that point? Ida Lupino, I think that was it. <laughs> and Barbara Hammer, who made these really good gay porn films. Um, <laughs> but that wasn't my mom. Um, <laughs> and um, she wanted to be an assistant director. But there was, there was already a female assistant director, so that, that slot was taken. <laughs> so she became a script supervisor, which she was very, very good at and spent the rest of her years doing. And I would have many breakfasts when I was a school kid, and she would go like this. And she'd say, oh my god, we crossed the line yesterday. I'll never work again. <laughs> um, but um, when I used to visit her as a kid on film sets, she would be the only woman in a room full of 40, 50, 60 white guys. And now when I visit a film set, it still doesn't look like Chicago, still doesn't look like LA, but it looks a lot more like the world than what I used to visit as a kid. And I think I'm not gonna rest until, um, if that can happen below the line, I'm not gonna rest until we do at least as well above the line and, and a lot better if we can. And if we had more time, I could talk about specific programs that we are moving forward with that are designed um, to make sure that the world that we hand to our children and successors looks an awful lot more like the world than the world of films and TV now. Do you think with the, the Oscar so white movement this year, and did they hear anything? Or they, was, it, was it still, are they still deaf, these, these six companies? I mean, did S Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, no, I mean, um, as, as Doug said, we can shout out to Doug too, right? Um, um, they're really, you know, it's an industry that is driven by fear. It is an industry that is driven by quarterly earnings reports and each quarter has to be better than the one before it. And um, I don't think they hear it. Um, I um, know somebody who was in the room when, uh, at every studio when, um, they're deciding whether or not to green light a film. They assemble in a room, everybody from sales and marketing, and they go territory by territory and revenue stream by revenue stream and say, how much can we expect from DVDs? How much can we expect from ad-supported streaming? How much can we expect from subscription video on demand? How much can we s depend upon in, you know? Right. And if those figures add up and they look at the budget of a film, then they green light it and those figures don't add up. They say, well, it doesn't fit our business model. At the meeting, um, you know, meeting after meeting when they're discussing um, diverse films, for instance, the meeting for Straight Outta Compton, they said, how much can we count on foreign? And the foreign person said, nothing, because they had no stats on what hip hop would do foreign. Right. Uh, but again and again and again and again, they chronically underestimate what diverse films will do. Um, you look at, say, the Fast and Furious thing. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a piece of homework. The next time there's a Fast and Furious film coming out, read the people like Box Office Mojo and all those people whose job is to predict what the opening weekend will be. And I will bet you, here and now, 20 bucks that the opening weekend is significantly higher than those estimates. Because every time that happens, they don't say, what's wrong with our algorithm? Or what lessons can we learn? They say, who could have imagined? 
Um, so, so, you know, I just think that the industry not, they're leaving money on the table by making films that reflect their own social circle rather than the world as it is. Okay. And so, um, there are also issues I know the Writers Guild is facing involve, um, cable, cable salaries versus network salaries and anim yeah. the animation issue. Is there movement on any of the? On any of the I should probably contextualize those. I mean that animation writers generally struggle to even be part of the union. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean it, it's complicated. Um, in um, TV, thanks to some brave writers for The Simpsons, um, a lot of TV animation is now unionized with the Writers Guild. Okay. In features, not at all, because Walt Disney started in essence uh, a sweetheart union, and. I don't want to get into union politics in Chicago, which is a union town. Right. Um, but why don't we just say um, that because of historical circumstances, um, feature animation is not Writers Guild for the most part, right. um, with very rare exceptions. And um, so if you look at a movie like, say, Frozen, uh, which Jennifer Lee wrote, um, I suspect she was well compensated. I know that she has a career that is just not going to stop because she's an awfully talented writer. Right. Um, but by my back of the envelope calculations, there's something like $14 million in residuals she would have gotten had that been a guild covered film that she's not getting, and instead she's getting that. Right. So, you know, um, yeah, I think, yeah, of course, animation should be unionized. And in terms of cable and networks, uh, when cables first started, they said it's experimental. We don't really have a business model. We don't know if we uh, are really going to make any money at it. So, like, you know, give us these lower rates. And of course, now cable is about as profitable business as there is anywhere. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, increasingly risk free. Um, and uh, what they're would they would like to do is bring network rates down to cable rates rather than raise cable rates up to where they should be. The money they're making is the same as network, if not more so. Um, but what they're paying really doesn't measure up. And it's just part of that larger disparity that we spoke of, of earlier. So writers generally are sacrificing salary in some cases to work in a, an environment with more creative control and, and, and arguably better content. Um, and the, the effort would be to equalize that if possible. Well, yeah. I mean... Um, uh, upwards, look, I mean, um, for people who are working in TV, um, let's say, you, for, you know, for the sake of argument, say Matt Weiner, Vince Gilligan, mm -hmm. they have great uh, creative satisfaction. They get to see their stuff done in a way that makes sense to them, which is not always true in features, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, and they get to create a kind of lasting legacy. Um, and they get to get paid nicely. So that's all great. Um, but there are so many ways in which the upside for AMC is greater than even for people like Matt and Vince. I mean, what would AMC be absent, though, you know, to those two series and maybe one or two others? They'd be showing bowling on Thursday nights. <laughs> You know, the value of the brand of AMC is incalculably more valuable now. And none of that goes back to the writer either. Right. So maybe we can explain, <coughs> excuse me, explain for the audience a little bit what the residual process means for, for working writers. And, and um, you know, when I, when I made my, when my second film got made, I was on Twitter and I was noticing that the, there were pirates who already are, you know, disseminating links to the film and... I got in this really stupid Twitter war with people, uh, with pirates, which was dumb. And I wrote a big <laughs> blog post about how upset I was, and that was dumb, uh, because none of it makes a difference with, with, with that. But um, so I, I guess my question would be, you know, is there, are we, are we working on that issue as well? Is that a... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have my own sort of way of, of fighting piracy, which is to write movies that nobody wants to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, which just cuts, pulls the rug right out from under them. Right. Um, you know, and the other way I have is by writing screenplays that nobody wants to make, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, that, that even like, you know, cuts off their revenue stream much, much, <laughs> you know, much more substantially. You're really winning the fight, Howard. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but piracy, I think, is, is a fight that, you know, 
we all share, all of us who make our living by intellectual property, have to figure out what that means in the age of free. Right. I think we've already seen a compression algorithm uh, more or less you know, destroy the ability of musicians to make money and want to make really sure that that doesn't happen to people who are other kinds of creative people, particularly writers. Right. Um, at the same time, sometimes the studios will use the fight against piracy um, to try to uh, get other things that they want, as in the SOPA legislation that was defeated a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Um, as writers, we want to make sure that there are the strongest and most robust protections against our work being pirated. At the same time, a utterly open internet is important for writers, and you heard some of them today, who are being entrepreneurial in a way that only the open web allows. If the web became, in essence, like cable, then maybe it would be good for the companies, but I don't think it would be good for writers. Right. So it's a set of really precise and careful calculations about how to stop piracy, but doing it in a way which doesn't turn the internet into some version of Time Warner Cable. Right. Okay. So we're going to uh, about to take questions soon, but I, I had one more question for you. Um, and I was wondering, given that we have a room of aspiring writers, uh, if you could give a piece of practical business advice and then a piece of maybe creative craft advice, what would you say? Um, you know, like take fountain? Yes, yeah. take fountain. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, which do you want first? The, the, the yeah. business, the, you want the business advice first? Or yeah, or? sure. Um, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> uh, if you're in a meeting with someone and that person says, We are going to make your movie, uh, walk out of the room. Don't yell at them, don't insult them, just walk out because you will save yourself so much heartache. Oh. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> um, as, as a piece of practical. Weirdly, 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 the bi practical business advice I would give and the creative advice I would give are the same advice, mm -hmm. which seems contrarian, but I don't think it is, which is every screenwriter I know who is successful, he or she started out by writing something that only they could write. Most of the time, it wasn't made, um, mm -hmm. but... Um, if they're looking for somebody who can do a kind of slightly cruddier version of whatever the box office leader was last week, they don't need you to, to do that. They've, they've got people like you know Tom and Doug and me to do that if they want it. Mm -hmm. um, the way you're going to break into the industry is by writing something astonishing, is by writing something, it sounds like a cliche and it is a cliche, but that only you could write. As a writer, all you have to sell is your time and your voice. That's pretty much it. And so I think both the way to feel really good about yourself as a creative writer and the way to try and begin a career are the same thing, which is write something utterly astonishing, uh, write something that isn't like any of the things they've seen, and then you've written something that they have to hire you for, or at times they will read it and hire you to do something else. You know, it's that Sundance syndrome. Right. You know, agents in, in sort of, um, you know, Arctic gear and cell phones coming up to you and saying, you've just made a film which is small and wonderful. Can I hire you to do one which is neither? Right. You know, um, <laughs> you know so, so careers get built in that way too. Right. But I really do believe that both as an act of the heart and as the most practical business plan you can make, write something truly amazing that comes out of you and your life. Great. Thank you. But with a little research. Right. You probably research quite a bit, I would guess. Yeah, and I love it. And I think when I first started writing, the machine I used to write and the place I went to research, which was the library, were two different spaces, two different machines. One was sort of microfiche. And one was uh, one of these things. And now the machine I use to research and the machine I use to write and the machine I use to distract myself are all the same machine, and it's deadly. Right. Uh, I really recommend, okay, here's a piece of practical business advice. There's a program called Mac Freedom. 
oh, right. yes. which basically cuts you off for the from the internet for a spe uh, s specified period of time. I've used this, yes. I use it too. It's very good. It's very good. Because it's, before that, it's worth its weight in gold. Before <laughs> that, I I lived in a three story townhouse yeah. in L A, and so I would um, my my internet router was on the basement floor. Yeah. And so I would uh, unplug it, walk up three flights of stairs. And then, and then write, because I couldn't get on the internet with it unplugged. And so if I wanted to cheat, I had to go down three flights of stairs, plug it back in, come back up three flights of stairs, right? And so that worked effectively. Yeah. Um, but now this software, it just turns everything off. Yeah, because I think ADD is the black lung of screenwriting. It's awful, yeah. yeah. And there's so many ways to be distracted. Oh, my God. <laughs> Including foundations and guilds and yeah. all, you know, all those Yeah, things. but at least those get you out of the house. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, I think we should take some questions. Um, so if you, you guys know the drill, if you want to move uh, to, the, to, the, to the microphone over there, we'll get you set up for questions. In the meantime, while that's getting working, uh, we've kind of touched on this just a second, but the, uh, the, the marvelization of things, I wonder if you have an opinion on, and we talked a little bit about superheroes and tights and then superheroes well, but and tights. Here's the thing, I, I, you know, as a child, I fled from the world by reading comic books. So right. I, I, I love that shit. Okay. You know, uh, I was probably more of a DC guy than a Marvel guy, but okay. it doesn't really matter. I mean, right. you know, um, and the fact that the culture that I immersed myself in as a kid uh, and as a young teen is now the culture that dominates the world in some ways makes me very happy because right. the world of movies now resembles my childhood imagination, and what greater triumph is that? Right. That having been said. <laughs> I was waiting. I was, I, was, I was kind of hoping for that, Howard. I was hoping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Movies are more than financial instruments. They're mm -hmm. more than return on investment. They promise something lofty and life-changing. I mean, if you look at the Universal logo, there's the goddamn globe spinning around. If you look at Paramount, there's something that looks sort of like Mount Olympus, mm -hmm. as viewed from Burbank. Flying um, stars. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Skimming the water like a TIE fighter. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're going to have logos that promise something that spiritual, lofty, aspirational, and potentially world-changing, then you shouldn't just make every film be um, based on previous IP, based on previous IP, based on previous IP, based on Stan Lee. Right. Uh, it is just the most, n it's the narrowest, the most constricted, and ultimately the most claustrophobic way of looking at the world. And it's a betrayal of the tradition and patrimony of American motion pictures. And I think that there has been um, a sense that movies can change the world. And I would hate if you and I were the generation where that, which was handed down and handed down, if we were the generation where that thread broke. Right. And speaking of movies that can change the world, I mean, we've been joking about Tom, but uh, I've told this story often. I don't get to interview Tom today, but uh, Tom's movie. We can, do it. we can do it right now. Yeah, Tom's movie, <laughs> Tom's movie, Dead Poet Society. I was a, I was a um, finance major, and I was going that way, and I saw Dead Poet Society, and, re and I knew what I wanted to be, and I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't have the power or the courage to do it until I saw this film and thought, you know, oh, captain, my captain, I'm going to stand up on my desk, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's how I have ended up on this stage with the president of the Writers Guild. Um, <laughs> so, so thank you, Tom. Um, that is the power of, uh, of cinema. And no, no superheroes in tights in that film. It was poetry that was the superhero. So, so thank you. So let's take a question from the audience. All right. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Abel. Uh, hi, Abel. I have a uh, question about, um, you mentioned uh, Trumbo and uh, Straight Outta Compton. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the biopic resurgence that has been happening um, within the past, uh, I mean, it seems that's been happening over the past uh, decade or so, but it seems that there's been a resurgence of that within the past two or three years. And I kind of wanted to get your take on that and see um, if there's any, I guess my question is, is there any sort of a, like actual uh, creativity behind um, like actual projects rather than just looking at historical accuracies within the country? Um, I just wanted to get your your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Hollywood um, has um, always had biopics. You know, I mean, um, you know, y you know, Paul Muni curing syphilis and stuff like that. Um, and I write a lot of stuff that is based on 
real people and real historical incidents. Uh, Savage Grace, the film that Brad mentioned, was based on an actual family of American expatriates behaving very badly abroad. Um, the first film I wrote that got produced, Joe Gould's Secret, was based on a nonfiction memoir. And I think there's something for the, f the project I'm writing now is based on two lives having to do with the board game Monopoly, the woman who invented it and whose contribution was lost to history, and a kind of scruffy radical professor in the mid-'70s who put out a game called Anti-Monopoly and then got the shit suit out of him by Parker Brothers. Um, but um, I think biopics are great for writers because there's already a kind of armature to build from. And it is, in some sense, you know, to use that, that awful phrase, pre-existing IP. There's some pre-awareness. Um, but it's also really hard, because you have a responsibility to your audience. If you're telling a true story, you have a responsibility backwards to the real people in it, particularly if they're alive. Um, and um, you know, I think there is now a kind of, um, you know, uh, writers, I think, sometimes get inspired, like somebody says, oh, I'm going to do a movie about the young Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or I'm going to do a movie about the young Hillary Rodham before she was Hillary Rodham Clinton. And they're, I wouldn't say they're easy to sell. I mean, you know, um, Captain America is easy to sell. Um, but sometimes they provide an avenue for writers to be able to um, get their material taken seriously in a way that they might not if they were just doing a story about, you know, a young female lawyer as opposed to RBG or... or Hillary Clinton. So I, I think biopics provide opportunities for writers, but they're really hard, um, partly because of the, the responsibilities going forward and backward, and also because real lives are sort of one continuous filament, and um, movies are about what happens between scenes. And I can tell you as a writer that figuring out the five or six emblematic moments that will somehow illustrate the entire life is really hard and really, really easy to mess up. Um, but I think if you do it well, it's really, really satisfying, too. I don't know if that answers your question no, at all. No, it does. Thank you. We had a, a success out of DePaul. Josh Golden, one of our graduates, yeah. sold the Frank L. Baum biopic recently. Cool. And so we're excited about that. It's, it's set up a new line. Um, yeah. But he worked on that for quite some time. Yeah. Okay. One um, more question, please. Hi. Uh, so if you write something that's amazing and different, how do you get someone to take a look at it in a business driven by a fear of failure, you know, for doing something different and uh, losing money? Yeah. Well, that is the problem in the crux of it, which is that, um, you know, uh, what we do is a craft and an art at its best, and it's also a business. And um, the business goes back and forth between doing reliably and repeatedly what it's always done before. And at uh, certain kind of pivotal moments, then they realize that doesn't work, and they panic, and then they go looking for the good stuff. I am old enough to remember Hollywood in the late 1960s, where the studios really were kind of buffaloed and didn't know what they were doing. And all of a sudden, Easy Rider and The Graduate came along. And they said to themselves, oh my god, you know, we don't know how to connect to an audience anymore. And these young filmmakers do. And what followed was the wild renaissance of Hollywood in the 1970s, where they were just giving a lot of creative freedom to young filmmakers to make films, which I think to this day are still a kind of high watermark of American studio filmmaking. Um, so um, what you got to do is be very persistent and very fortunate. But I still will tell you that even in a fear-driven environment, even when the movie studio's definition of what is a studio movie has never, ever been narrower than it is today. I mean, it's like looking at the world through a soda straw. But at the same time, um, the, um, really good work, uh, I think, gets discovered more easily now than ever before because of the power of the internet, because of, of things like the blacklist, and um, the kind of, you know, um, deeply flawed people who behave badly, 
which you know studios no longer really are that interested in in terms of motion pictures, are the staple of television now. You know, so there have really never been more opportunities for writers to write deeply interesting things with actual real flawed people in them than there is now. Uh, in terms of how you get people to read them, um, I would recommend um, even if you're shy, even if you're a shoegazer, I mean, I spent my childhood, you know, under the blankets, but I can walk into a room and tell people about something I'm writing because, not because, because the work deserves it. So you got to figure out a way of believing in the work and then being shameless in finding anyone you know who might push that project forward and asking them if they would show it to someone, asking them if they would read it, asking them if they would hand it to their uncle, asking them, you know. Uh, it's really hard to do, and I cringe whenever I do it, and I feel a sense of, of shame and failure, um, and um, it never stops. But <laughs> this is the life I'm recommending to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Howard, that's the end of our time, but I'm truly honored to have spent this time with you, and thank you for coming to Chicago. To well, if us. we can, thank you, and if we can start with a note of glorious introduction and end on a note of failure, then I've, our work here is done. Yeah, that's, the, that's, <laughs> that's three-act structure. Yeah. That's the life itself. Yeah, thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you very much.